It has been a day of changeable weather conditions at Brands Hatch and qualifying for the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Europe opening round is coming up in a moment and as you join us so the rain is falling and this is going to make qualifying very lively indeed we've had two free practice sessions the first one was dry the second one was twice affected really by uh, very heavy showers indeed and who knows what the next hour has got in store but it could lead to a very jumbled brace of grids david addison and john watson are trackside and john it's been as i say a very odd day weather wise and now the team's trying to second guess the elements and know exactly when to go out Fantastic, absolutely, <laughs> because it might well get rid of the predictability of the usual suspects getting onto the front rows of the grid. Yep. So we've had a mixed match. If, it was, if this was Easter, you'd call it a curate's egg weather, but it's not, it's a bank holiday, and curate's eggs don't happen on bank holidays. But there, look, you can see, Brands Hatch was resplendent five minutes ago on that shot, but now you've got the cloud, the rain, the wind, piling in and it'll pile out every bit as quickly as it's piled in but what it's going to do is mean that the racetrack is going to be intermittently wet and intermittently dry and will it be wet enough to run wet weather tires or will anybody be prepared to take the punt and stay out on a set of slicks that's a question not we can answer it but down to the pit lane to do so well, the cars will be heading out onto the circuit shortly. Let's just have a look at the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit. You have the first twisty section, the Indy circuit, before you go out onto the Grand Prix loop itself. Speed builds on the run down to Pilgrim's Drop. Turn right at Westfield. Uh, right again as you climb up through Dingledale into Sheen Curve. The tight left into Sector 3 of Sterling's short straight down towards Clark Curve and the end of the lap. And John, you're working all the time. Although there are straights, they're not very long. You don't get much of a breather. Well, in, in truth, there is barely a straight in that literal sense at Brands Hatch. What you've got are very shallow curves. For example, just looking here, just at the bottom of your screen, is what would be euphemistically called the pit straight. But it actually is an extension of Clark Curve and Clearways that bends its way all the way up to the top of the hill to Paddockle Bend, where you have a proper bend. Everybody is preparing and lining up. Now, who are the brave souls that are going to go out on a track that is certainly wet enough to consider wets? but may well, with the wind that's blowing, dry up in the time we've got for this qualifying session. It's a gamble for everybody, and everybody needs to be very, very aware that conditions are different to the last time when they were out on track for FP2, what just finishing just over two hours ago. So we have the drivers for Q1, 20 minutes, good to go. This determining the grid for the first race, and then of course a standalone session for the second, and this first Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Europe uh, session about to get underway. Stefan Ortelli, welcome back to Blanc Pan GT. Stefan, we missed him, didn't we, at uh, Monza a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, he's a bit like a Duracell bunny. He just he <laughs> bounces around and he's always happy. Great to have Stefan Ortelli back. Always been a part of GT3 racing, part of the Blanc Pan family for many, many years, even going back to the days of GT1. Mm. Benchmark time, David, for everybody to think about in dry conditions was that set by the number four black Vulcan mercedes morrow engel set that time a 122.9 ended up almost half a second quicker than christopher meese now we understand that number 88 mercedes the car that rafael marciello and vincent abril share is going to go out on slicks everybody else thus far on wet but actually most cars are still up on the jacks so they're going to leave it to the last moment to commit i think well race director has actually declared it a wet track so you are permitted if you so choose as the 88 aka asp mercedes has done to start on slicks lights have got to be on as well that's mandatory in wet track conditions the only time that you're not allowed to use wet when the track is not declared a wet track and therefore you're not permitted to use wet in those conditions. But there you can see the directional arrow. These are directional Pirelli tyres. And is somebody going to change? It looks like they may well be changing onto a set of slicks. And that's a very, is that a new set of slicks going on to the 90 Mercedes? It's another Acker car, yeah. isn't it, interestingly? So more and more making their way down the pit lane, but I think we could see either many go out late because they're waiting to see what the others do with tyres, or those that are on wet uh, come in early. I think and that, that, that 90 car, that's the uh, Silver Cup car, which doesn't have quite the level of experience that mm. the 88 car, which is the full pro car, has. So Acker maybe splitting their driver lineups to see which is the way to go. Anyway, track is now gone green, cars are flying out on track. So they all come pouring out onto the circuit and 
in theory, this session should get quicker because once it stops to rain, then it'll dry up and so the times will come. But that presupposes that we don't get any more rain. Look at those weather. Look, ambient 8.6, chilly at the best. Yep. Track 9.1, not a lot better. Take into account the wind and the chill factor. Well, maybe it's not even as high as those two other factors that we have just seen. Everybody will start, well, not everybody, but all but one are going to start on the wet weather tyre. And I will not be surprised that by the time they've completed their outlap, they may be filing back into the pit lane to say, you know what? It's bad here at the start finish line, but it may not be quite so bad here as we head out and down onto the long, well, the, the, the curving straight that leads to Hawthorne's Bend or Hawthorne's Corner. The line there is probably bearably dry enough for a set of slick tyres. Through goes 76, which is Ricky Collard at the wheel. And uh, new to the Aston Martin ranks for the purposes of this season, having been part of the BMW programme of years past. Son of touring car racer uh, Rob Collard, who was on the podium at Donington a week ago. 63 is Mirko Bortolotti to do Q1. So up to the end of an outlap. All into the pit lane. Wait until they're all filing in. How wrong am I going to be? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, yes. well, well, nice bit of editing there, really listening to what the commentators are saying. Lamborghini stays out, Audi stays out, in fact they're all staying out thus far, trying to get warm into the tyres at the end of this next lap, uh, then we're going to start looking at the times. Well, we don't know, we understood that there was only one car on slick tyres, that was the 88 Mercedes. We assumed that everybody, or we were told everybody else was on wet weather tyres. Maybe they did make a last minute change going to be, as ever, a very interesting session of this. So, Dry weather tyres yeah. on the number two car. But finding it's time, letting everyone else do the hard yard, see what the track surface is like. Charles Beard will go first in the WRT Audi. So at the end of this next lap, we'll start having an idea about what lap times are like. It's two sessions that we will have uh, on the live stream. And before we get into times, it wants me to say to uh, GT racer and television producer extraordinaire Richard Hay, who's watching on the stream. Uh, Richard, get well soon from all of us. So through Hawthorne's turns there, look, 89, the Nico Bastian Mercedes and Nico, one of the Silver Cup drivers, reigning Silver Cup champion, sharing this car with Thomas Neubauer. That was another one we think has gone on to the slicks. Well, that is going to be a very, very strong driver lineup. We saw back at Monza earlier, well, at the middle part of April, uh, Christopher Meese. Yes, Christopher, stay warm. <laughs> stay, no, you need to be, you know, the worst thing is being chilled. You know, you've got to keep your body temperature up. So if Mirko Bortolotti, will he come in this time and decide that, no, I, I think the 63 Lamborghini went out on the set of sticks. I think you might be right. I mean, our information about what people were doing with tyres was a few minutes before the session got underway. There was time for one or two, perhaps, to do a, a last-minute switch. Uh, but, I mean, you know, it depends where you are in the pit it, lane. Absolutely. At yeah. the point, I mean, if you're standing at the end of the pit lane, you can see as cars yeah. come through. But if you're maybe at the head of a pit lane, you know, looking into another garage or you're know, doing whatever, sure. you may have made the assumption. So I would say that Pedro Lotti is on slicks and that he's staying out. And as he stays out, the track will gradually, certainly a drying line will begin to appear. At the same time, he will get slowly temperature into those tires, albeit we believe they are on slick tires. But a little rain maybe is beginning to fall again as he comes down through Pilgrim's Drop up into Hawthorne's. Well, he just had an absolute best in the sector for Charles Beard. Bortolotti, personal best. He is already the fastest, 130.873. We're a long way off the best times of the day, but we're on a wet road. Well, this lap, I have to say, will be maybe a couple of seconds quicker. Assuming there are no mistakes from Bortolotti in the last sector of the circuit, he's about to enter that last sector, now coming into sector two. Purple, well, 2.3 seconds yeah. up. So this is going to be maybe something in the middle, 26 or 27, if he can continue. And the track hasn't had a localised rain shower just at this very point. And I'm just looking outside to see the rain falling on the windows of our commentary booth. Doesn't look too bad. Lap times are coming down. Personal best, absolute best. And the lap time then is a 27.922. So that's 3.6 seconds quicker than anybody else at the moment. And Santa Brill car that we were told had started the session on slick tyres. Wait to see what the young French, or maybe he monogast, can achieve coming across the line. Well, 129, and that's a little bit further back than I might have anticipated. It's Kelvin van der Linde in the 66 Audi, who's currently second quickest, quarter of a second behind Mirko Bortolotti. 
as one of the Mercedes or the Acker cars. Oh, so just a bit unfortunate that could have backed off a little bit more and allowed the car. Charles Vett's on, on the line to get through a little bit more cleanly, but there we are. Now, who else is improving? Pretty much everybody. Kelvin van der Linde, absolute best first sector, best middle, Timo Bogovodowski. Exactly. Look who's gone quickest. Oscar Tunho, Audi number 10. So it's almost as the road dries every car through, but now the spots of rain are coming, so have we had the best out of the session? Who knows? Watch Kelvin van der Linde, he's going to get to complete this lap and he's fastest overall in Sector 1. Is he fastest in Sector 2 overall, or is he going to be green for the South African? Well, we haven't got that time yet on screen, but Kelvin van der Linde, good, clean exit out of Sterling's now. The run down into Clark Curve, into Clearways. Kelvin van der, Kelvin van der Linde, if that is rain in the air, we've got it on the windows of our commentary booth. Could snap provisional pull away. Portalotti regains it with a 25.8. Kelvin van der Linde's got over the 25-6. Fantastic lap. So it was two personal, sorry, two absolutes and one personal best. Kelvin van der Linde goes quickest of all, 125-664. The margin is 0.172 of a second. Wets off, slicks on to the Mercedes. And we've not yet had a time out of Stephen Pallet, number 26 out. You're looking at Andrea Calderelli, who is currently sixth, and you're on board with him now, coming out of Westfield. Yes, up the hill. Watch for those trees. Now get your nose slightly wider on the entry there than I maybe thought he would have liked to have been just to carry the ultimate speed. Now into Sterling's, gets the car in, lets the car run the curb. That curb has been modified, maybe not quite as we understood it. The point is he can get a clean run down into Clark, get the nose in again, not getting it in as tight as others have done. But the rear calorie rain on the windscreen as he comes now through the exit of Clearways. Making his way, staying tight against the, the, the barrier up the hill, goes seventh quickest. Red flag, so does that lap count? Because he, the red was out, possibly before he got to the timing line. Need to have a look at that, but there is a car off at turn one. Two cars off at turn one. Well, that's Paddock. Yeah, we can't see them from our comms box window, but there are two cars off at Paddock, I understand. And the red flag is therefore out, and the race director calls for this stoppage just so the cars can be retrieved well there's one car just early in the exit we can see that from the commentary booth can't see the other one i think it further so there's still one car one car we believe managed to drive through the gravel there's another car uh it's sort of before you get into the compression okay. in paddock hill bend so that's got to be attended to and uh, that will take another 15 or so minutes i suspect to get everything finally cleared and tidied away. And the rain is beginning to fall again. And there's oh, the car upside down. down as well. Yeah, that's not so, a good sign. Well, that's 555, isn't it? Which means Diego Menchaca has had the inversion. He's OK and out of the car. But Diego Menchaca off. And very rare do you find a GT3 car upside down. But he's gone through the gravel, hit the tyres. Hit, hit the tyres and the, that's flipped the yeah. car. Yeah. But he's so okay. he's that's perfectly fine, news. yep, let's look again. Oh, it goes in backwards, how did he get into that situation? Rams it into the tower wall in reverse, and uh, then the car just automatically, the, the forces, the kinetic energy rules the car forward, so damage around the rear of the car, but hopefully, hopefully, as with the driver, no damage to the driver whatsoever, and probably a lot less than might have been the case, but that's going to take, as I say, I mentioned, maybe 15 or more minutes to get the car righted, and it's slightly awkward because all the ways that you would normally remove a car from the gravel, there's a lift point that you access through the top of the car, and now the car's upside down, there's no natural lift point. Indeed, and that also means it's out of this session and the next because of the damage. So Taylor Proto will end up starting at the back of the grid for his race, and Diego Menchaca was 16th out of the 26. Now, he is the, the one driver that needs it to rain heavily now to preserve that time. So the clock stops, of course, with being qualifying, so all of this uh, adds to the uh, time of the day, as it were. Just under 13 minutes to go, but uh, you've seen the reason for the red flag, and quite rightly, with a car inverted, there was no way the session could continue. It, it, just watching it there from the arty shot that we've got on board from somebody's mobile phone, they're, they're all, you know, think, that's our car, hopefully. The driver is uninjured, the car isn't too badly damaged, and I think the car will be damaged around the back, but 
it hit one of those tech pro barriers which absorbed an enormous amount of the energy and that then got absorbed as the car then rotated slowly and ended up on its roof so there is the recovery vehicle its first task is to get the car in my view righted before then it can be lifted and safely removed uh, back ultimately back to the team Diego Manchaca who has raced here before in single seaters but uh, disappointing return to Brands Hatch yes yeah, it, he would he went backwards he was he had spun the car the car had spun maybe it occurred under braking I don't know we didn't catch it early enough to determine what was the cause but once it was going backwards I mean there's nothing you can do except sit there and basically brace yourself for what is the inevitable but fortunately those tech pro barriers were sufficiently far up that the external part of a pedicle bend that did cushion a lot of energy yeah the problem in part was the angle wasn't it here it is again he's already lost it yeah as there on an angle uh, and uh, he's going backwards it acts as a ramp and we know there was another car involved which we've not yet identified let's have a look and see whether as the car is upside down Oops. Through the gravel. Well, one of the oh, WRT Audi. Yeah. Well, that, with, with a car upside down and yellow flags waving, won't go down a storm with the stewards, will no, it? No, it will not. Uh, but again, uh, one might assume that there was a sudden change. I talk about localised rain. Yeah. I mean, at a number of racetracks, and here at Brands, we have seen rain falling heavily in this area of the racetrack, whereas around the back of the circuit on the Grand Prix loop, it was much lighter. And I just wonder if there had been that little bit of localised rain on the approach up into paddock which just simply you know you i've been caught out but every racing driver at some point probably has also been caught out by that you know sudden variation in track conditions and there isn't an awful lot of warning you can get because you're just relying on what you can see from your peripheral vision before then uh, you, you arrive upon it and undiminished speed in some cases so the car about to be righted we have an estimated restart time which is just about 10 minutes away Oscar Tunho, I think it was, in the Audi that we saw, by the way, going off through the gravel. So uh, Greg Masters, the head of the stewards of the event, might want a little word about that. Diego Menchaca had, inevitably, improved his lap time to get 16th, and then off he went, and drivers sit relatively patiently, waiting for the resumption of the session. But this is going to be interesting to see how they go about writing the car. You know what? I know it doesn't sound uh, very technical. Why don't they just roll the car over onto its wheels? There are enough of them marshals available i know health and safety probably wouldn't permit it these days but it would be the for me the quickest and most logical yeah. way of, of getting that car righted I mean, they're, 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 they're going to pull it from one side and, and try and do it yeah. with a rope rather than with humans yeah. pulling on one part of the race car the entire load is going on to that uh, rear suspension the right rear suspension and transmission and, and whatever else great for everybody to see what's underneath the yes. Lamborghini by the way you can see the way that the airflow is channeled as it comes under the nose and then partly split to go around the side so here we are this, this is the crunch moment when the car eventually gets up 90 degrees and then here we go let's bring the car down without having it fall and do any further damage you know, it's a, You've had the, all the, the tension on the pool, now you've got the potential of, a, of the shock load as the car. There we go, there we go. Uh, the recovery guy, driver, is doing a good job because he's managing to keep the tension. And he's going to let it go down now. Is that a what part of the oil system is that that's come out of the back of the car as well? I had a feeling that was more to do with the recovery, but I might be wrong. Anyway, the car is right here, thankfully. So now they've got to pick it up. Uh, they've also got to reconstruct uh, that barrier mm. so that's another little task that has to be carried out our motorsports getting ready for the continuation of the session 76 Ricky Collard and we are about five minutes or six minutes now so rather from the uh, estimated restart time I think that might be revised mm. that's just a feeling I've got with the rain in the air but uh, there is I think there are actually a vehicle going out no, it's not a vehicle going back to the paddock. I'm just looking to see if there's any any further vehicles being dispatched to the scene of the incident. But now, let's hear from the other driver of 555, Diego Menchaca, uh, we know about. But Taylor Proto, his co-driver, is with Dakota. 
Taylor, that wasn't so good to watch your car. But let's talk about Diego. Is Diego OK at the moment? Yeah, as of right now, I've heard that Diego is OK, which is all that matters. Lamborghini gave us a really safe platform to work with. So thankfully, he's able to walk away from that completely, uh, hopefully scratch free. But we'll find out the details soon. Um, it's really unfortunate. Diego is a monster in qualifying, so he could have really given us a good result. But it's qualifying. There's no points. We'll come back bigger and stronger tomorrow if we can. And if not, we'll be ready at Silverstone. Now, this is your first year in Blanc Pen. I see Tony behind you. Is he actually coaching you through this process? Yeah, Vin Antonio has given me a lot of help. Obviously, he's got a wealth of experience with his long and uh, successful career. Um, and he's the sort of help I need because I'm not the regular driving uh, student. So he's able to give me more specialized help. So really good. And was there anything you had knowledge of the car, maybe wrong with it before he crashed, or no knowledge of anything? We had a problem with the drive shaft in the morning, but we fixed that. So as of right now, it just looks like it's, uh, it could have been a driver's input, or it was just unfortunate with the conditions. It's really greasy out here, and we've been dealing with rough conditions all day, so it is what it is. It is what it is. Good luck, Taylor. Thanks. Bit Antonio Liuzzi, the driver coach in question, and uh, there in replay, Diego Menchaca having that big rear hit yeah. into the tyres. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the, the, the barriers, the Tech Pro barrier and the tyre barrier behind did cushion an enormous amount of the energy and, and that dissipated uh, and the car rolling, while it looks very dramatic and very concerning for those involved in the pits particularly, it actually was the way that prevented and uh, protected the driver from any kind of, sort of uh, whiplash or whatever could be uh, normally expected to be in a rear end shunt of that nature. So it's righted, it's being lifted, and uh, the uh, restart is not that far away. Everybody else gets ready. So down in the uh, pit lane, the sun is coming out as well, <laughs> incidentally, as you look at the uh, Wolfgang Triller Ferrari that he shares with Florian Scholzer. And that car at the moment is 18th out of the 26. Lucas Stoltz, only 24th. He's the man that's got to be on his toes when we go back to a green flag. Just looking in the car, using sunglasses with an openish face looking helmet. Mm. Anyway, you wouldn't throw back to days of yore. Yes, indeed. Uh, indeed. I, I, if I wear an open-faced helmet today in a racing car, I feel very, very uncomfortable, very exposed. Very exposed. Yeah. As we once again have a look at the Spitfire, which had come over the circuit earlier in the morning, uh, probably other big and hill as we talked about at the time. So the Lamborghini, the 555, is being craned now back to the. The recovery vehicle that will bring it back ultimately to the pits and uh, the team can get stuck in it'll be a longish night probably a bit chilly in the pit lane i think once the light gets done it's not exactly warm with the sun out either yes the teams have been reminded by the officials today that you need to have your garage doors open we know you're cold but it is in the regulations that you have to have your garage doors open uh, they have been sheltering for warmth right excellent recovery work done and uh, the car about to be lowered down you can see actually there's the rear wing doesn't look to be actually damaged, no, and that, that is sort of, you strange. wonder, where, was that a front or rear engine shunt? Front yeah. or rear end shunt, mm. not engine, front or rear end shunt. So hopefully, hopefully the team will be able to get that car turned around overnight with a minimal amount of uh, time spent and damage to the car. So, sun's come out for the moment, there might be more rain on the way, given the way today has gone, but Kelvin van der Linde starting uh, at the moment on provisional pole position for race one. 125.664 is the best time. He's 0.172 of a second up on Mirko Bortolotti. And then third quickest, it's Steins Krothorst. Vincent Abril, four, Charles Viet, fifth, Oscar Tunho, sixth. So very shortly, I think we will be back in business. Look at those temperatures. Started off at you know, high yeah, sevens and eights. Track temperature is now colder than ambient. That's the first time I think we've actually seen that situation today. So again, you know, when everybody goes back out on track, I'm assuming they'll go back out on slicks, but they'll have a lower ambient, even lower track temperature. And that's going to take you know, the best part of a couple of three laps to get everything you know, back to the point where you feel comfortable to lean on it, and that's what you have to do. So there's the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari ready to go, which is Renat Salikov behind the wheel, ever improving and very rapid Russian driver. So Menchaka, 16th at the time of the incident. Is he going to be able to preserve anything like a decent grid position, or will he tumble to the back? That's a little bit dependent now on the rest and the weather as we get set then for. Uh, the resumption that car's going to be returned to the Park Ferme area uh, rather than direct to the team. Mirko Bortolotti then ensconced at the wheel of 63, ready for qualifying to get back underway. 
which is imminent. Pit lane is open, but still red flag conditions on the circuit. All right, so it's been put back a minute to 1617 TBC. So uh, we, we're a minute behind, but so we're almost there. So a very odd start to it because not everybody's got into their stride yet. As I was saying, you've got Lucas Stoltz in need of a good lap yet, Nico Bastian uh, as another. And so there's a lot to play out when we go back to qualifying. 13 minutes, you're going to lose the first lap as an out lap, the next lap as an installation lap, and getting your tiles up to temperature. So in terms of numbers of laps they're going to get, what have we got? Nine laps, eight laps, if that? Well, 12 minutes remaining, so let's say one minute, 30 lap in these conditions. So you're talking about six laps, now it's nine minutes, maybe seven laps at best. So out lap, feel the track, feel the car, whatever. First flying lap, just push a little bit harder to get a sense of what Paddock Hill Bend, because you're not going to go through Paddock Hill Bend at a proper racing pace, because if you leave the pit lane, you're, leave, you're entering Paddock from the access, pit lane access road. So it will take the second flying lap, which will be effectively your third lap, before you might feel actually comfortable enough to lean on it. And that's assuming that the track has got some level of consistency. Low track temperature, low ambient temperature, the wind's your big, big ally, because that's going to be the thing that ultimately might help to dry the track out more quickly. You can see the differences in track surface colours, the damp bits there and the offline as you come down towards Hawthorne's Bend. So nobody really will be over on that part of the racetrack, other than if they try to make an overtake. But bearing in mind that is wet, you wouldn't want to go there uh, in any circumstance. So the session is about to get back underway. The Lamborghini is almost uh, off the circuit because it's now being brought back to the Park Ferme area and it will come through the back door of the pits. So the gate opens, the track is clear, the green flags fly, we are back in business and out straight away goes Kelvin van der Linde who wants to get on with the job. He's pursued out by Milan Dodger, so Attempto got their cars to the front of the queue nice and early. Very important, you know, it's all about you know, thinking through Forget the emotions. Uh, you know, this is business. We're here to do the best we can for our team, for our backers. So being at the front of the queue, it's not an arbitrary thing. You don't sit in the garage and sort of suck on an ice cream and think, well, it's a time now to go down. Or you, know, you work it out. That's what team personnel are there to do. So Kelvin van der Linde, who drives 66, shares that car with Clement Schmidt. Van der Linde, we know he's very, very quick indeed, former uh, South African Volkswagen champion on the Sirocco R Cup as well, and he's been a GT mainstay for the last three or four seasons now. And we've still got one or two drivers in the pits, not yet having ventured out, but I think they will do so in a few moments of time once they've worked out what they want to do with tyres. So uh, I would imagine that most people are looking skyward to think, well, that's going to dictate what we will do with tyres. Yeah. Right now, track is pretty much bathed in sunlight. So that's Van der Linde, he's the pioneer, he's the first man now, after that interruption, to find the grip levels on every corner. Anybody that's behind him, uh, namely, initially Milan Donjo, and then Stein Scott will be measuring their pace against Calvin Van der Linde, who now comes through Clark Curve up towards the timing line. It was on the run up into Panicle Bend, that was the scene of the uh, Lamborghini Orange. One FFF racing, where it got all wrong and it went backwards from this point onwards. Kelvin Van Linde pushing, but keeping that little bit back. Next time through, he will be more committed. Yeah, he needed indeed. to know how it would be on the first flying lap. So Van der Linde it is then that's the quickest in the session. Bought a lot in, then Stein Scott Horse, Vincent Abriel Charleville and Oscar Tunho sixth. And we're almost at the halfway point. Now you're starting to think back towards flying lap. So this is the time when we need to be looking at sectors and seeing if anybody's going to be able to improve. Calvin van der Linde then goes not quite as quickly through sector one as he has previously, but he's on the Grand Prix loop now. But if we get no more rain, the times are going to get better and better as the session wears off. But David, has, the, the, he was only down by 98 hundredths of a second. You know, it's virtually matched what he did on yeah. his best lap. So track conditions right now, looking skyward, looks good for another quick lap from Calvin van der Linde. Van van Abril, absolute best. Just look down at you as saying it. Purple for Abril in Sector 1. So the Mercedes 88, quicker than anything in the session, before or after the red flag, quicker than anything in the session, fourth fastest. So you're looking at van der Linde, we'll get him over the line, because this will be an interesting time, but he's down by three-tenths or so in the middle sector as well. 
We've got an absolute best by Stein Scott Horse, who's further back in the queue. So here comes the first part of the shuffling into the second part of qualifying. Nine and three quarter minutes on the clock. Through has gone down to Linda, and the lap time is a 125.442. Stein Scott Horse goes quickest on a 25.124, and Vincent Umbrella's done two absolute bests. The Mercedes booms over the line now, and Vincent Abril in 88 is quickest on a 124.480. Vincent Abril then goes to the top of the times, and Lucas Stoltz there is up to eighth. I mean, for Vincent Abril, that must be a deep breath. I think, well, finally, finally, I'm stamping my my ability and performance in a qualifying session. It's learning in Monza, a little bit of learning here this morning, but that's a very, very good run indeed. 24.4 in these circumstances. And from now until the end, nine minutes remaining, the track can only get better. Question is, did teams maybe pull the trigger a little bit too quickly and maybe not gamble that the track would get better? and the track might get drier and maybe have they gone maybe two laps too early? Let's see, Bortolotti, absolute best, personal best, up towards the line he comes, Bortolotti's best is a 25-8, he goes over the line, does a 24-3, and that puts him quickest of all, Marco Bortolotti to the top of the times. So, eight and a half minutes now remaining, and there are still cars in the pit lane, but primarily the most, the usual suspects, let's put it that way, are all out on track. Now, where's the next gun time going to come from? It's Bortolotti, Avril, Scott Holtz, Van der Linde, Simon Gachet up to fifth. Nico Bastian is sixth, Andrea Calderelli seventh. No, that changes because Stoltz has just gone sixth. Lucas Stoltz goes sixth quickest. The Attempto Audi is there, 55, up towards uh, Druids. That is Stein Scott Horst, who is currently third quickest. This is Bortolotti, though, who is the fastest, and he's got quicker a game look in sector one. That's what I said, have some teams maybe waited, or not or not waited too long, but knowing the point to go, that more Merco Bortolotti would appear, as has Grasso Racing, to have found the point where the track, you can see the track up here, Sheen Curve and going into Stirlings, the line is dry, that's the light tarmac. Unfortunately for Kelvin, the Linda uh, was at the, anyway, getting slightly held up by one of the sister cars. Bortolotti, fastest overall in the second sector as well. So is this going to be a very low 24 or a very high 123? Let's see, because everything is perfect so far. He'll come across the timing line. Let's see, it's going to be in the 23. So 123, 945. Mirko Bortolotti, and look, he was slower than he had been in the last sector, but it was still the best lap of 123, 945. One second slower than was done by uh, the Mercedes number four this morning. Mario Engel, track conditions as they continue, as long as they've got life in their Pirelli tyres. So there could be, if Mirko Bortolotti can keep that momentum, either Shorthorst or Gachet or Van der Linde or Abril or Calderelli or Stoltz or yep. whomever, anybody in the top ten at the right moment in time when this racetrack is optimised and they've got the rubber, the life, the peak of the Pirelli tyre performance could steal this pole away. Unpredictability. I said years ago, track should have sprinkler systems on them. Yeah. Turn them on, wet the track, and then it go dry naturally. And then we might get something a little bit more interesting. Nothing. That's Andrea Calderani. He's got personal best in sector one. One and a half seconds down in sector two. But this is not going to see a massive step forward for the sixth place. Currently, Andrea Calderelli stays in the sixth place. We've had a lap time cancelled from Timor Bogatlaski, who is seventh for track limit abuse. Portolotti at 23.945 is the time to beat. Fastest first and second sector on this lap. It's going to go quicker again, potentially. No, in fact, misses out again. 24.4 at the end. Again, it's the last sector that's the bogey sector for Portolotti. Two laps in a row slower there. Strange, hard to understand. Now that you've got three, well, basically two corners, Sterlings and uh, Clark and Clearways, which is really one and the same. Yeah. So the WRT and the Santa Lock engineers studying all of the data. And Calvin van der Linde has just gone second on a 124.068. So it's Bortolotti, van der Linde, Scott Holt, Gachet, Avril, Wiertz. 87 here is Jean-Luc Bobelic, and he is 20th. Do you know what? It's a bit of an Audi lockout. The front two rows provisionally. Yeah. Audi, 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 Audi. Except for this Lamborghini. It's an ID powered uh, Lamborghini. Absolutely. I'll drive I didn't want you to pick up an ad, but <laughs> I thought I was being really clever. <laughs> 
But you're right. I mean, they're, they're no, no. strength in numbers anyway, yes. don't they, yes. But you're absolutely well, right. Listen, listen, the VWRD group. Yeah, no, you're right. Except that's what Abril wants to argue now, because yeah, he he's gone second as well. But at the, at the time I said it, he was fifth. So no, he's quite um, right, absolutely. Uh, we need to get the Astons up there as well. 76 here, Ricky Collard, he's ninth quickest. Ricky Collard, great little character, and uh, goes very, very well. He's made a good name for himself in GT racing. He was a single-seater gun to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching him when he was doing something in single-seaters, yeah. and he strutted around like a little centurion. <laughs> but actually, I mean, if he's found a home in a team like our motorsport, with the backing and the professionalism that that team has got, what a wonderful destination yeah. to find yourself in. Yeah. Yes, he's been through the BMW Junior ranks. Andrea Calderelli now goes quickest. Uh, Ricky Collard improves to go seventh, but Calderelli is fastest ahead of Nico Bastia. We were talking in free practice about the battle between the Lamborghini teams, well, there's the battle between the Mercedes teams as well, but for the Orange One FFF racing team, Andrea Calderelli, the player manager, is quickest, but Nico Bastia has just done job. Exactly. Unpredictability. A silver cup car, Nico Bastia, on the provisional front row. We've got three and a half minutes, or just over three and a half minutes, of this session remaining, Bats and Abril goes fourth fastest overall sector one. So it is changing as almost cars come across yeah. to compete a lap. Very exciting, this is what qualifying ought to be all about. Indeed, Nico Bastian, the point, he's on the front row at the moment, but he's also done the absolute best in the first sector. So what can Bastian do at the end of the middle? Let's see, he comes through the timing beam, it's a personal best. So Nico Bastian is building this lap together nicely. Now he has got to find four thousandths to equal Calderelli. Yeah, but his sort of best sector one and two have cancelled one another out. So yeah. he's a sort of net, net situation. So he needs to be mega, mega good on the exit. Out of Clark and Clearway to come across the start finish line. And he is. Go, go. No, he's, he's not done. done. He's got he's quickest. Got quickest indeed. 123.483. So Nico Bastian then does go fastest with an absolute, a personal, and a gain. As we saw with Bortolotti, a slightly slower third section. But Bortolotti fights back and has gone quicker still. Mirko Bortolotti by 55,000. He's back onto provisional pole. You're riding with Ricky Collard, who is still seventh. Yeah, Ricky tried to make an improvement, didn't come. So we've got a Lamborghini, Mercedes, Lamborghini, Audi, Mercedes, Audi, Aston Martin, Audi, and Mercedes. Oh, great session, isn't it? Here you've oh, got another great. very, very quick car, 56, which is the Attempto Milan Doncha Audi, but it's not actually delivering just yet. Doncha stepping up from GT4, in which he was a champion last year, to GT3, so perhaps just getting his head around the machinery to an extent. We've got two minutes to go. This is one of those sessions where you want to hide the checkered flag, but two minutes to go. Portolotti is the quickest. I don't know how much left Portolotti will have. He's completed 11 laps, which will have been on effectively the same set of tyres. Charles Vert comes through in currently at 12th position. Uh, Lucas Stoltz, by the way, says fastest second sector overall. So the number four Black Falcon Mercedes may well find itself up in the top three or four by the time he comes over the line to finish what will be his ninth lap. There it is, coming through. It's gone quickest. Yep. Lucas Stoltz, 123.261. By 0.167 of a second, Lucas Stoltz goes on to pole position. Great lap. Didn't see it until the lap was complete. But again, as the track is improving, the ambience coming up, the track temperature is coming up, tyres are working in that tyre zone. Runs a little bit wide, but nobody's going to be pinged, I oh, understand. Oh, oh. That's Gachet. Simon Gachet off the road. It is now Mercedes Lamborghini, Mercedes Lamborghini. That's coming off, clearways off Clark. That's yeah. been the boogie corner for the number 60 Lamborghini and for other drivers as well. So maybe there's still a little bit of moisture just on the entry into uh, that final two corners. Timo Bogoslavski here has dropped down to 14th. Uh, Diego Menchaca inevitably is now 26 because everybody else has been able to get a dry lap in. There's another car running wide at Clark Kerman on the grass. It's back on again ahead of Bogoslavski. And the car in question was 62 Aston Martin. So he got away with the moment, but uh, ahead of this man, just further up the road, is the recovering Aston of uh, Aro Vainio, who is currently 12th quickest. Right, what have we got left? 37 seconds, less than that, even. Nobody of the top six looks like they're on a... I mean, Benson Abril has just done a personal best at the final sector, but his lap wasn't going to challenge those ahead of him. So it looks like the top three grid rooms, three rooms of the grid, are pretty much now locked out. As Whoa! Oh, oh, no, oh, no! He must have ridden the curb coming out, and that's the right rear, and that's the car that would have been starting on provisional pool position, provisional front row position. Second fastest, absolutely right. So Mirko Bortolotti bins it, but that means they may not be in Q2. 
So 63 has gone from hero to zero. David, there is no question, he will not be in Q2. So, red flag and a chequered flag, session's at an end. But, I mean, that would have been an inlap, potentially, and Bortolotti has binned it. He has indeed, Christian Engelhardt walks away, shrugs his head and shoulders. There we are, so he knows that car will not be in. I mean, we didn't see the, what led to it. I suspect he, that Bortolotti that has got too wide too early in the exit of Sterling's ran. Here we go, watch this, David, look, comes in. Carl, has, has he got a little bit of oversteer there? He just runs too wide, yes, the oversteer sets in. Too wide, too early, gets onto the dirt on the outside. Now, we saw this every year when we come coming to Brands, somebody has done it, but yeah. up until this moment, everybody's been pretty well behaved. So a heavy impact on the right rear, so that's going to be suspension. Maybe some of your transmission, bodywork, and then two Lamborghinis in rival teams. Yeah. You see the flame in the engine bay. Christian Engelhart watching that, knowing that his work for today is done. So that car won't be in Q2, and... Mirko Bortolotti will be second on the grid, provisionally. I mean, the, all you can say is he was having a go. Teams don't mind as much when a driver has a shunt if he's on it, if he's trying to improve. He was trying to put that car onto a full position, and he made a mistake. He's still in the front row of the grid, so there is an element of forgiveness within a team. If that was a driver... You know, of a lesser quality, who was not really up to the game and was just out there wasting everything, then that's when teams get upset. But in this instance, I think they'll feel that their man was going for that provisional pull, which probably would have become the pole position. Lost it in the penultimate corner. It's not often we see Virko doing something like that. No, absolutely. So everybody else now makes their way back to the pit lane. And where possible, of course, they will now change the driver over and we'll be ready for Q2. So, at the end of the session, Lucas Stoltz, fastest for Black Falcon from Mirko Bortolotti, second quickest, Nico Bastian heading the Silver Cup third and Andrea Caldarelli fourth. So, Mercedes Lamborghini, Mercedes Lamborghini, the best Audi in the end, only fifth, Kelvin van der Linde, Mercedes sixth, Vincent Abril, Stein Scott Hall seventh from Ezequiel Perez Compank and then Ricky Collard and Simon Gachet rounding out the top ten. Shea Davis, new to Brands 11th, Aro Vigno, new to Brands 12th, Oscar Tunjo 13th, ahead of Timur Bogoslavsky and Charles Vier 15th. After that, Phoenix Audi of Kim Louis Schramm uh, ahead of the sister car, Finley Hutchison at the wheel of it, Stephen Palette only 18th ahead of Milan Doncha and then Louis Machiels. For Rinaldi, it's Renat Salikov 21st ahead of Phil Keane, Jean-Luc Bobali and then Niels Stevenart, Wolfgang Triller 25th and of course Diego Menchaca, we just did not really see the best of, but as John makes the point, two Lamborghinis badly damaged out of rival teams. This was the first one, rear damage. Yeah, uh, again, when you saw the damage, in fact, I mean, the rear wing, look, it is damaged, but it, compared to what it looked at the moment of impact, I thought, here's the second one, and here's the problem. I've been talking about this all through the two yeah. free practice sessions. There has been an alteration. You can see the impact virtually square on, but there was the right rear took the most of the depth. There has been something that is different about the curbing and the exit of Sterling's. It used to be a more aggressive, or the, the drop-off was more aggressive. But what drivers have been doing consistently is using the full bits of the curb and dropping a wheel off. The trouble for Portolotti was he dropped the wheel off too early in the exit, and in that sense, he had his, the, the attitude of the car to the exit of the corner was such that the pendulum effect began to take over. Remember, the grass is wet, the, the mud or whatever you want to call it, the, the earth out there, wet as well. So the level of grip he was going to get on the grass and on the, the earth was lower than he was getting on the, even the slippery curb. So the cars have the driver change and we'll get back out as the sun comes out in this quirky day of weather, but the two Lamborghini teams, the Grasser squad and the uh, FFF racing team now with a lot of work to do. 20 minutes the session should be. But very rare, as John rightly says, that Mirko Bortolotti makes mistakes. We've had lots of people doing that in the past, but as the temperature has been going up, uh, that's the first car that we've seen out of a Blanc Pan session to go off at that part of the road this year. And if you'd have predicted who might have made a mistake, Bortolotti would not have been that man. However, Brands Hatch looking magnificent. The Grasser team, very frustrated, understandably. And Christian Engelhart doesn't get a chance to go out and qualify. Now the question is well, exactly what damage has been done. We might be able to hear from Christian or Mirko in due course. Meantime, Sean Paul Breslin at Black Falcon is a happy man. So is Lucas Stoltz with the pole position. 
Black Falcon that's specialised in VLN races but came into the Endurance Championship last year to great effect and it's good to have the team in sprint as well this year in the 1R races but Lucas Stoltz, uh, an excellent job for that lap. Yeah, I mean, Lucas Stoltz, very quiet, gently spoken in a race car, a real tiger and that was illustrated in difficult track conditions for everybody. He put that Black Falcon Mercedes onto a pole position. Couldn't have done a better job. So as the uh, drivers offer advice to their teammates as to what the track conditions are like, ready for the second element of qualifying. Still one or two dark clouds loom overhead, but Christian Engelhart just hopes that that car can be made good for tomorrow. You can see the huge frustration at the Grasser squad, but Mirko Bortolotti doesn't have a track record of doing things like that, but very, very annoying for the team, as you can see. Christian Engelhart forces a smile, at least. Good to have him back. There was talk at the end of last year that he wouldn't be part of the Grasser Lamborghini squad, but he is on the Grasser books. He's on the Grasser books, he's not on the... Lamborghini, Lamborghini books. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's not a, a Lamborghini factory driver, but he is a Grasser contracted driver. And he and Marco Bortolotti so, have worked well together. No, they're a super team. I mean, there was this awful circumstance or situation that occurred last year at the penultimate round at Nürburgring. We don't need to go into the detail of it. And the fact is that Christian Engelhardt, as a race driver, is a very good partner to Marco mm. Bortolotti. They won a lot of races together. So he is no longer a part of the, the family of Lamborghini as such as other drivers as Bortolotti is but he is in the Grasser team because he is a valuable asset. Indeed. So the Audis there are all lined up, ready to go. In the background, I think you can hear Lucas Stoltz talking over the circuit's public address system, talking about that qualifying session. And uh, we'll try and, there he is in fact, going into the garage. So uh, it's our turn now. Dakota has managed to get in the queue and we'll talk to Lucas Stoltz for a word about that uh, pole position run and uh, Luca Stoltz their tops Q1 at Brands Hatch. Luca, absolutely mega lap from you. Are you happy with that? Yeah, definitely. It was it was not the easiest qualifying I ever did. Uh, it was yeah, some wet parts, some dry parts, and uh, you really had to push. Uh, the team did an amazing job. We went on new tyres uh, really at the end, uh, which which made the biggest difference to the competitors. And uh, now I'm I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Super tricky conditions. Do you think you've made the right choice with this qualifying too? Well, we went out of wet in the beginning, which looked kind of wrong because then it started to drizzle and. Uh, Suddenly the red flag helped us and uh, yeah, in the end it was dry, so it was, was a good decision. Good for you, let's see how Mara goes, thank you. So Mara Engel is in the car and a new set of slicks goes on. Are those new slicks or are those new slicks? I'm just trying to get a look. They are Sticker new slicks. slicks. Yeah. Sticker slicks, that's what he needs. So he's going to have the same opportunity that Lucas Stoltz had with a new set of Pirelli slicks to go out and get just looking behind Pedicle Bend at this grey, black, whatever. But above the racetrack itself, there is still a reasonable amount of sunshine on the track. Track temperatures are a little bit higher than they were at the beginning of Q1, which is going to help everybody get those new ticker, sticker tyres up to temperature quickly. You need to go out now, nail it, and get a, a, your time yeah. established. And whatever happens thereafter, you, know, you may go too quickly or you may wait too long. There are some of the damp patches. There is the reason why the session hasn't got underway, because there's still a recovery vehicle. Oh, and that's this somebody else. incident. After Portolotti, maybe? No, this is just more incidents, isn't it? And seeing people running wide up the kerb. So that, uh, that is going to be a problem. Yeah, you're right. That has been a problem since we got here, and I don't know what brands can do about it. Whether there can be some kind of notification to drivers that anybody who has seen to run two wheels as we're seeing here. Well, you know, it, it, it makes an awful mess of the racetrack. Jonathan Palmer spends an absolute fortune, I was going to say of his money, but of, of the circuit's money, to produce a beautifully manicured racetrack. And then you get a load of guys come along and they just chew it up. And it was Jonathan that what, what, what was one of the leading proponents of this track limit regulation because of people driving all over the curves and the grass. but. Uh, it, it looks good watching cars slide there, but of course, as John has made the point, you drag all the muck onto the road and other people lose traction. Yeah, but apart from that, what you do is you get a stoppage. We've got a car, lost control, ended up in the barrier, that's going to be returned. The, well, there's still work being carried out somewhere between Stirlings and down at uh, Clearways or down at Clark Curve. So we're losing time waiting for all these recoveries and tracks to be fixed. That's going to be a problem corner until something 
in my opinion, is said to drivers that if they want to continually abuse the limits on the outside of Sterling's, they face getting a penalty. You get maybe a warning, a double warning, then maybe a drive-through if you continue to do it. David, somebody's turned the lights out. They have. I was about to say blue sky, because we had it on one camera, but on that, you can see what's imminent. Electric light orchestra, blue sky, do you remember it? It's like the Beatles song, lovely Lindsay from Liverpool, do you remember that one as well? We've had just about every weather you could have at uh, Brands Hatch today. We're probably not done yet. Right, so here we are, good to go. Sun at one part of the circuit, grim weather on the way, green flag. And again, if the teams are on their toes, they will know, look at that, that the rain is coming. We need to get out. We've got to get a banker lap in. Yeah, but you can't if you're stuck on the line and the line ain't moving. No. Nope. You know, it's slowly, slowly, you know, catch the car ahead of you. But the bit of cloud that's just to the back side of Panicle Bend, if that ever unleashes, there you can just about see it. If that unloads in Panicle Bend, it will be a skating rink of Olympic proportions. Well, absolutely. So everyone knows that they need to get out and get the time in. All rear wheel drive cars, of course, so you didn't need to worry about swapping tyres over. But uh, you've got there Oscar Tunho, now Rick Brokers at the wheel of the number 10 Audi, ready to go. Sticker slicks on that. Pirelli, of course, supplies the rubber for everybody in. Uh, the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe. Everybody pours out on track now. So I, I mean, I, it's sessions like this that I truly love. Yes. Because it, it, it also rewards, in a way, those that roll the dice. David, look at that. Look how black it is. When you come up through Sheen Curve and then you're faced with a wall of black cloud almost sitting on top of the trees as you turn into Sterling. Now, this corner, watch what drivers are doing in the exit. Will anybody have picked up that you go? Oh, look at the background. It's me. really black now. God, this is a, a triple X certificate. Nobody under 25 is allowed to look at these pictures <laughs> because it's too much for these young ones. It is horrendous looking. Blimey. So, this could be a one shot qualify. Very wide goes Maro Engel, but he's certainly trying hard. It's got to. He's only have, he may only have the one lap in which to do it. And it might be the next time he comes up to Pentacle Bend, that racetrack is about two inches deep in water. Engel goes through Graham Hill Band onto Cooper Strait, runs it wide over the kerb. Hits the brakes down a gear, turns in absolute best sector one. Feeds the power in onto the Grand Prix loop now. So here the track looks to be about as nice as you're going to get in a day like this uh, in Britain. So down the hill. Watch for the curb turn in. You can pick up a lot of speed by getting on the throttle early and really driving the car hard, run the car. By the time you get to that curb, the car should be parallel, it should be straight. If it's not straight, you're going to have a problem. Into Westfield, the bump, 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 bump through Westfield. Car up and down on the suspension. In the dip at Dingledale, up the hill. Make that apex, otherwise you'll be too wide out to the left and you'll compromise your entry into Sterling. Obviously going to be quickest car on the track right now. That is how you exit Sterling's bend. There is a, a masterclass from Mauro Engel. And this is going to be the target time, although Christopher Mies has gone quicker, in fact, within the first sector subsequently, but Engel is stringing it together nicely. This will be the target time. Mauro Engel then comes up, breaks the beam now, and the lap is a 1.23.776. Here comes Marvin Kirchhofer over the timing line. Oh, let's see what he can do. He goes second on the 23.779. So this is going to be the quicker session. Fabian Schiller has gone fastest, though. 1.23.604, Fabian Schiller. And we need to see next Dries Van Thor, number two Audi, when he comes through. And it's raining. The rain has come. Yeah, the weather was inevitable. And that's oh, 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 that's Mies rather off the road. Christopher Mies goes off. And he's in the tires. He's been collected. He's been collected. Look, by another Audi. That's going to be a red flag. That's a red flag. I mean, the, the condition, this is what we were fearing that all of a sudden there'll be a, a cloud. But people are spinning down at Surtees as they go out onto the Grand Prix. Yeah. So this session, the, the left rear of that car has gone. It's Ortelli that's collected him. Stefan Ortelli has collected Christopher Meese. So Meese had gone off. He was getting back onto the circuit when Ortelli lost it and went into the parked car. Well, I mean, the driver can only see what he sees out of the windscreen. I don't know if the team would have had any prior warning of the rain that would have been falling at this part of the racetrack. Where they are in the pit lane, they might not have seen it. But all of a sudden, you arrive down there, and the track is wet. Yeah. Not just damp, it's wet. And there is nothing you can do. You're a passenger, you're on the biggest set of water skis in the world, and nothing to stop you except the barrier on the outside of the track. Rain pouring down. 
absolutely brilliant. And one final car, I don't know, that's just come out of the pit lane. Let's look and see, hits the brakes, turns the wheel, but doesn't do anything, the car just keeps going straight. Straight, 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 hits the barrier, but the damage was done when the second RD yeah. piled in. So, so look, oh, there it is. There's Ortelli, yeah. so he's lost it, and just wrong place, wrong time for both of them. Yeah, so it's the left rear, not Ortelli's car, the left rear actually has been removed from the, the RD. Wow. Well, drama, drama, drama. And will this session, will anybody bother going back out again? The rain is absolutely coming in sideways. We have a number of cars that haven't done a lap time. Well, the, these are amongst them, but... All they can do is take, go back to FP2 and take the times from FP2 and relate that to qualifying. But, I mean, some people have set bona fide times. Yeah. And I don't know whether they delete that. No, you... But again, look at the watch on the bottom yeah. of the screen. Going into Sterling's car, running wide, going into Sterling. There is the impact coming out of Clark Curve into Clearways. For those that haven't done a lap time, they would have to start behind those that have done a time. It's up to the stewards to work out what order they want to Dries put Van them in. Four, Christopher Mies, yeah. uh, Ortelli, Ortelli Hasser, Winkelhock. Christian Engelhock, obviously not. Yeah. It's so, be a great grid. Well, you know, to some degree, Christian Engelhock is probably going to sleep a little bit more easy tonight because oh. he knows that his principal rivals, who he is amongst many of them, are going to be starting probably alongside him for the second race. But, of course, this is not an easy circuit at which to overtake around, especially in a big, wide GT car. But if you've got, potentially, half a dozen very quick drivers trying to forge your way through, it's going to be a, a great spectacle. So, On, I mean, I hate to say it because we've got damaged cars. There's no injury to any of the drivers because the, the impacts are not particularly high impact. But unpredictability is that, I mean, talk about uh, the rain now. I can hardly see Paddock Hill from our commentary because there's absolutely black. Our cameraman next door, who is in the elements, but on the same level as John and I in our commentary box, he has been braving wind and rain all day. And he's just about hanging on to his camera. Send on the St. Bernard's and a flask absolutely, of brandy! Absolutely, but our camera crew doing a great job. All the marshals at Brown's Hatch doing a great job as well, of course. Is that thunder as well? There is a bit of thunder, I think, hovering around. Blimey. You can hear the wind in the background, that's I don't for know, sure. Is the wind picking up on the external yeah. microphones? I think that's it is, that's the wind, yeah, yeah, that's the wind. I thought it might have been a roll of thunder. So, we'd had precious little, one lap out of some, but not out of everybody, and Christopher Meese, just to make the point again, before he went off, had done an absolute best sector one, and of course a personal best in sector two, because it was his first flying lap. But it could be that the grid now ends up with these drivers, well, certainly he'll be at the back, because he hasn't done a time, and Ortelli hasn't done a time, they won't get back out because of the damage. The others might be, but they are might be able to go back out, but they are dependent on the weather improving, to get a dry circuit to then get a representative lap time. I mean, how long is a piece of string? I mean, are we, the, the damage that's being, well, first of all, we've got to remove two cars. Yeah. Secondly, whatever damage was done to the, the barrier at the exit of Clark and whatever else. And while this is all going on, there is rain falling. Mm. So if the track gets wetter, ain't anybody going out. Well, other, other than they still need to establish a grid position. Yeah, so if you've not yet done a lap, you need to go out because a lap time Correct. is better than no lap time. Absolutely. And then you do have an order to shuffle, if you like, of the wet laps. And then you've got the question, are you within 101% or whatever, 110% of the yeah. quick? But I think that would be waived in this circumstance because Indeed. this would be called force majeure. But this is not going to be a quick removal of two cars. They're still in situ and all these great, wonderful fans that come down to support all British motorsport, the length and breadth of Great Britain, have remained absolutely stolid in their seating positions, but I mean, they're going to get blown away right now. We know how bad it is outside because the cameraman I was talking to you about has, has quite understandably come into the warmth. Um, he's now stripped down to his T-shirt and shorts in this tropical weather in the commentary booth. Um, Stefan Ortelli and Christopher Meese's cars still to be retrieved, and the medical team there still as well, just making sure the drivers are okay. So as soon as possible, the, the track will be clear, but it's not going to be an instant... No, it's not. I mean, this is going to be... Uh, well, to get two cars removed, both embedded in the, in the gravel on the outside of the corner, will take 15 or so minutes. I um, mean, there are what, maybe seven or eight recovery vehicles of one kind or another at the scene of this incident. And uh, some of them will be there to remove the two Audis. Others will be there to repair the damage to the barrier. Exactly, yeah. Well, while we are 
uh, waiting for the incident to be sorted. Let's uh, catch up with more drivers because uh, Timo Bogoslavski was in the first session, did a very good job in the Silver Cup, and Timo Bogoslavski is with Dakota. Now, Timo, the situation here is constantly changing, but you guys look to be in a good position right now. Yeah, we're so lucky. Uh, the Fabian did an amazing lap. So and now we're at, at P1 in the overall. So it's uh, it's so important because I lose my qualifying because I have a lot of traffic and uh, not good conditions. But now it's the situation is looks very really good. So. What, what do you think your best advice would be to Fabian in the car now? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Good luck for your race. Thank you. No problem. I'm saying get out of the car and uh, get changed because nothing is going to improve in terms of challenging your provisional pole. As we look out of the window right now, I mean, it has gone from being a beautiful late May afternoon at Brands Hatch into a miserably wet. And there we can see one of the ideas now being lifted up. And that will have to go onto the back of one of the recovery vehicles. There it is awaiting it, two sitting side by side. And from Brands Hatch's point of view, the, the, the event point of view, there is this session, a race and a GT4 qualifying period to run. And of course, a half six curfew. Ooh, and all of this is making ooh. that timetable very tight, I would have Amongst thought. other things. Yes. Amongst other things. Amongst other things. Yes. So, as the rain is get, getting worse, he, he asks a cameraman, get, look, rain getting worse? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, says. look, you can see, yes. I mean, that is rain. We haven't had rain like that on a consistent basis all day, but that is what I would describe as rain. The track will be thoroughly wet. Yeah. We've never seen it other than maybe little patches but thoroughly went all the way around. And it looks pretty set in as well, actually. Yes. It's less of a shower. This, this could be here for a, a good few minutes, yeah. So 16 minutes to go when the session gets back underway. And it will be open to the teams, but whether they want to go out is up to them. But as I say, those that haven't done a time will need a lap time. Uh, for a number 76, Ricky Collard, we were getting excited about earlier. And he, in the pit lane, is now with Dakota. I'm always going wet my hair. Ricky, you're currently in fourth right now. A British car, is it designed for this kind of weather? It is indeed, I think. Um, I'm a bit gutted in my session, I never really got the lap together. Um, but Marvin has just gone out there and put a belter of a lap in. It's thunderstorms we're hearing now in the background, so I think that might be it for, um, for us. Um, maybe, you know, if it rains, we're definitely going to get out there and put some wet laps in. Um, but if he does a quicker lap on wet tyres, then he's done a, something special. <laughs> Where do you think the Aston holds an advantage on this type of a track? Uh, we're good in the high speed, so out the back where it's quite ballsy, the car is um, the car's pretty quick. Um, but then when we go into the slower, tighter corners, you know, it sort of favours the Audis, the Lambos, um, those sort of cars. But no, I think um, I think our car, our package, is is really good. And any concerns so far? No, not really. Not <laughs> faster. <laughs> okay, good luck. Thanks. So Ricky Collard, as I said early on, he's a good little character, is Ricky, and uh, he did do a good lap. So also. Uh, Co-driver Marvin Kirkhofer up then fourth. Was that a, f a bolt of lightning I saw? Something just suddenly illuminated in front of the screen. So we've got thunder in the background, Probably, we've got rain. Yeah. So the only thing we don't have is lightning. We've had snow, we've had hail. Plague of frogs. Yeah, that's, that's hopefully not ordered. But what a day of weather. Everything crammed in. 87 from the Akko team. That was the car that Jim Plough drove to 13th in the dry. It's brightening up, by the way, behind us. There's blue sky behind our uh, position on the pit yeah. straight. I said ELO. Yeah, I, yeah. You yeah. didn't get it first time, I'll say it again. No, 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 I got it, I got it. <laughs> uh, I mean, what a day. What a, I mean, for the competitors, they've never really been able to get into their stride. No. There's always been something or another that just at the point you're about to think, right, now I've got a baseline, I know where to work from. And then there's been a, a red flag or there's been weather interference or... You, you've been on old tyres at the point you should have been on a fresh set of tyres, or then it was wet, then it was half wet, then it was dry or half dry. Well, the two cars have been retrieved. Uh, the road is clear, the barrier is repaired, so excellent work to uh, sort the incident out, and therefore the fast lane is open. And we are due underway in just half a minute's time, with 16 minutes to go. And how many takers are there? Not one. Not a car has moved yet. So uh, the session will go live, but as I say, it's up to the teams whether they want to go out and do a time. Yeah, I mean, estimated restart is five to five, which is about well, two and a bit minutes away, I would have said. 
So still a red flag situation. There were still marshals actually on the track up at Clark and uh, just leading into clearways. So they'll be brushing away any gravel that may have been not pushed onto the track as a consequence of what went up at the clearways. The session is about to get underway. Before it does, let's hear from his equal Perez Compank. As equal, now WRT in the past has been very successful here, but today it's not really going your way. Dries hasn't even done a lap in the dry yet. Yeah, we were really unlucky. Uh, we just delayed a little bit the exit of the pits, and uh, yeah, this is what you get, you know. Uh, lucky's not on our side. Uh, luckily, like uh, Chris is fine, so that's the important part. And uh, yeah, now we will do a lap on the rain just to get some positions uh, compared to the guys that didn't do a lap, but it's going to be tough. But well, tomorrow is a long day, so anything can happen. Are you happy with your qualifying session? No, not at all, to be honest. Uh, I had some traffic, so I think I could have improved uh, quite a little bit more. So, yeah, but it's how it is, you know, just... Uh yeah. Let's see how Dries goes in the wet. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so just, it's interesting to hear what Yuzuki has said about luck wasn't uh, on our side. I don't believe in that sort of luck. Some teams got it right. Yeah. That wasn't luck. They got it right. Mm. If you don't get it right, it's not bad luck. It's just simply you didn't get it right. I know it's hard to be hard on these kids and <laughs> tell them things, but you know, I, I, sometimes it really it irritates me when people say, oh, it was bad luck. If you weren't on the track when the track was at its best, that's not bad luck, that's bad judgment. I wasn't hesitating to disagree, I was hesitating, thinking in my own mind, there's no Vincent Voss here this weekend, he's away overseeing the first WRT DTM entry. Now, right, Pierre Giudone is in charge, and we know that he knows what he's doing from his days with WRT and Orica, but had Vincent been here, do you think that would have made much of a difference? I don't know how much actual hands-on day-to-day input, I mean, really it's down to the engineers on each individual yeah. car to determine who would uh, go out at what time. And if you've got a, a spread of cars like WRT has, you might send one or two out before you send the entire fleet out because you might hedge your bets one way or the other. It's all a part of you know, being on top of every element. And the weather here clearly has proven to be and is probably going to continue to be a part of the element, certainly as far as Saturday is concerned. Well, we're back in business, and there are a handful of cars venturing out. Ricky Collard made the point, we'll, we'll get some wet laps, go and get the data. There's number one, so Dries Van Thor goes out, he needs a lap time. So even though, at the moment, he won't be able to do anything about those dry laps already set, he would like to be, if you want, the best of the wets, and therefore be a bit further up the grid than right at the back. Well, the time that he could maybe access is that of Frank Stippler, who is currently 17th quickest. Frank's best lap at 131.25. And those were the kind of times that we were seeing when the track was in that sort of not entirely wet as it is right now. Tuck, you coming down through Dingle Dale up into Sheet Curve, that the track is wet. Yeah. I mean, no hesitation. So it would be a surprise if anybody would manage to get below a one minute 30 unless there's a sudden dry line appearing. Sun's out again. But the trouble is that it's the ambient and track temperature have fallen away with the, with the rain that fell just five minutes ago. And that rain is still on the road, it's not disappeared yet, as there Andrea Bertolini tiptoes out. 444 is Florian Schultzer, uh, new to Blockpan GT, or back to Blockpan GT this year, having been away in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo. But look at the spray the car generates, it heads up towards the timing line. Florian Schultzer now starts a flying lap, flying in inverted commas. So your tippy toe down into Paddockle Bay. Keeps very wide, which might appear not to be the natural line, but when the track is wet, drivers, I keep repeating myself, frequently will look for the long way around the corner where in these track conditions you will pick up a little bit more grip. So this will be an interesting one to see what sort of a time he can do. And in fairness, Schotter is an amp, so we, we shouldn't expect pro lap times irrespective of the conditions, but he's nicely sideways out of Graham Hill Bend. Yeah, Graham Hill Bend is one of the few corners that is difficult to find the long way around. And you could see as he came out, there's a lot of rubber there on the exit. So the back end under power just began to... But he controlled it on balance, on throttle and steering very well. So this is what it's like in an Audi at the moment. So Dries Van Thor hustling on, finding where the grip is, turning his way up through Druids, through the hairpin. It's Christopher Meese right now of all the cars that's on track that probably is going to be the quickest when he completes the slap. No, because so, no, he's damaged, isn't he? He's not I'm taking sorry, part. Right, that was the lap that he did. Why did he not take off. those... So-and-so um, so times so on. So-and-so times on, yes. <laughs> the it. purple times, is, could you look down quickly to pick it up a purple time? Yeah, because he had done that best yeah, sector yeah, yeah, yeah. and then fell off the road. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we, we've lost him. Getting overexcited. Uh, don't worry, it's one of those sessions. So much has happened. This is Van Thor, and he's a study of concentration. 
that shows you how wet it is down towards Pilgrim Stroll. We haven't seen much of that part of the circuit, but that looks like a Winter Club meeting, not a Maybach Holiday GT event. Um, Moving around, looking for the grip. Yeah, and also just trying to get some temperature into the wet weather tyre, because the more you can load the wet weather tyre, the warmer it will get, and therefore the more grip the compounds that comprise wet weather tyres will give back to you. We've just had a lap time, so Marcus Winkelhock has done a wet lap, a 142.1 as against a 123 in the dry. Well, I say that the, the, the bogey time I would have thought would be place 17, Frank Stippler on a 131.2, and Marcus Winkelhock is precisely 10 seconds away from that on his first lap. Van Tor in action, and you can see him at work as well on the split screen here. So this is the view from inside the car, the man at work, and over the timing line goes Dries Van Tor, and that's a 143. So that puts him ahead of Rick Brokers, that puts him 20th on the grid. So we've got a time out of Christopher Hasse. A 140.2 is the best wet time. So we've got, if you like, class dry, class wet here. Uh, Christopher Hasse, a 1 minute 40.255. Exactly nine seconds to the thousand slower than the best, the, the worst dry time of Frank Stippler. Well, we've, we've got 10 minutes remaining if the track gets quicker by a second per lap. But have these cars got fuel on board that they could stay on for nine minutes? What's going to be six laps approximately, maybe slightly less than that, depending where much you are on the track. Uh, the confusion coming up into Sterling's. So that's 26, that's Marcus Winkelhock who on this lap is slower in the middle sector but quicker than he had been in the first. So Winkelhock here, 19th, trying to get himself at least one or two places further up the order. He knows he can't suddenly bolt up the grid, but if he can be the best of those with a wet time, a wet weather time, put himself a little bit further up the grid, it will be a help. Over the line comes Vinky now, then breaks the beam and is still 19th. That was a slightly better lap though. Yeah, so he's, again, it's, it's still that 17th position, that's the, the best, I think, that anybody in this group that are on track can aspire to uh, reach. Up oh, that's going to be the end, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, cool. it, it's, it's it, you can see how difficult Marcus Winkelhock is really having to use all his experience and skill just to maximise the performance in really, really difficult positions. It's Kibler Schramm's car, French Dipper at the wheel of it, it's all going through. So here, up towards the line, Van Tor once again, a 1 minute 40.733. That puts him up to 19th at the expense of Winkelhock now. He's still got to find those nine seconds or so, hasn't he? Well, that's not looking easy. Well, the second of lap, oh, 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 just under braking, looked like he was really, really, Dries Van Tor on the limit as he braked up into Druids. Did a good job of just keeping the, the balance of steering input and brake pressure. Frank Stippler currently in 17th. But Frank isn't going to improve on his current time. No. He's out there, I suppose, well, maybe get some laps in the wet. Nothing more he can do. Phil Keane's just improved up to 19th now because he hasn't done a proper lap. 138.591 for Phil Keane and 519 Lamborghini. Stippler in the Phoenix Ram Audi. Blasts his way now down towards Paul Thorns. Multiple class champion within the VLM. And of course, bad weather at the Nervo Greek is no surprise. So Frank Stippler, a hugely experienced driver and uh, a very, very safe pair of hands, will bring the car to the end of the session. Seven and a half minutes are still to go. Finkelhock up to 18th. He's done a 137. So he's narrowing that gap. A 131 is the target. He's done a 137. Yeah, we've got seven minutes remaining. It's. Well, I don't know what to say. It's possible. If you find five seconds, yeah. seven is a big ass. Yeah. Because while the track might get less wet, it isn't going to get dry. And the only way you're going to really improve is by putting on a set of sticks, but the track will not be dry enough to do so. Frank Stiffer has done what he needs to find out, the level of grip that the track has got at this particular point in the session. And he can't improve from his 17th grid position. And he He's got no need to try and defend him because he's still got a six and a half second advantage over the 18th position of Marcus Winkelhoff. Now, Chris Verhasse pressing on. He's done a 38-1, and he's just done a personal best within the first sector as well. This is the Santa Lock out in number 25 that he shares with Simon Gachet. He's on it. He is, isn't he? He is definitely on it. This is Chris Verhasse pushing very hard, not to try and get up to 17th in the grid, but to try and depose Marcus Winkelhoff and Phil Keane, who are directly ahead of him. Christopher Hauser, currently provisional 20th. So Hauser then up through 
Gene Curve. Let's see what this middle sector is going to be like. It was a personal best. He's down in the middle, though. So game ground loses ground. And therefore, the ultimate lap time may not turn out to be an improvement. Six more minutes to go. It almost looks like he's... I was going to say back down a bit towards the end, but he is still going for a time. No, no, the line. this we're waiting to see because where we're missing to see the ID come across the line. Well, it was 18, 18. so he's made a little bit of yeah. an improvement, one position. So that gets him a road further up the grid, two places. Whoops, oh. sideways, and he's off into the gravel at Paddock. He'll be able to get the car out of there. Wet, compacted gravel, doesn't hit anything, so Hassel just knows how to bring it back. You know, you're never certain of track grip levels until you lose control, yeah. and that's the moment you discover you've just gone that bit too quick. Don't know what happened, just the back suddenly snapped oh. away. Oh, and 25. That's Marcus Finkelhock off the road, way, way yeah. off, and he's having another spin. That's at 30, he's yes. nearly at Clark Curve. He's gone so far across the grass. Now, can he get off there? Vorsprung door technique. Great dude, that's Marcus. Yeah. I think it's like a drifting display. Yeah, I mean, even with the wet weather tower on, you know, the amount of track that he's got, he's just gone round the pirouettes. And people would come and pay to watch him doing this if it wasn't actually a proper session for qualifying for a good position. So he's going to try and find a bit of traction. He can see the road, but he's heading against the traffic. And, and that's, that's yeah. the concern. Drivers have been going off there throughout the day. And as they try to get back on the track, they're actually going head on towards the traffic that is on the racetrack going into the Sturgeon Stand. Well, he has got going again, despite the drift display. This is Haza, first of all. The back end just lost, then he overcorrected the back end, got away. Again, caught the curb as he made the correction. So the whole thing, good ending to what could have been Marcus Finkelhoff. This is what happened to him. Under brakes, into Surtees, on wet grass. Well, you might as well be on ice. The level yeah. of coefficient is about the same. Oh. I'm sure somebody ring in and say, no, 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 they're not the same. And that's been, they must have felt the same, for sure. So Vinkelhock goes on, back on again, after his magic roundabout moment, and the session has got four more minutes to go, and there are very, very few people out on track now. So Christopher Hasse is... Uh, 141 was his last lap. Well, that was because he had his... Yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. just looking to yeah. see if anybody has got close to his... Eight, his lap that keeps him at 18th, 136-0. That would look to me to be about as quick as anybody who is on the racetrack is likely to go. Well, Hazler is the quickest of those in this wet part, yeah. so he's the, be he's the, the best the, with the wet feet. The one that I thought that might challenge would have been Marcus Vinkelhoff, yeah. and we just seen what happened to Marcus Vinkelhoff coming into Surtees, the back end swapped and he was going off track. So your, your, your back row is going to be Christian Engelhardt and Taylor Proto, the penultimate row, Christopher Meese and Stefan Ortelli. So you've got three gun drivers there trying to forge your way through. It'll be quite a race, this. It will be. Uh, you have to think that Christopher Meese is the one that's going to get the job done. Unfortunately for Christian Engelhardt, he didn't get a chance to run on what was a dry track at the point in the car, or just before uh, Mirko Bocarotti went off at the end of Q1. So he's going to go into it in a certain amount of the unknown. So Haza again up in the first sector, down in the second. And the time he is pitching to beat his own is a 136.047. Can he at least improve that time? He'll get yeah, two he'll more get a, laps out of it. He'll get a fit 135 in this lap, yeah. I think. 35 8. Yeah. yeah. So it keeps him 18th, but it narrows the margin against Frank Stippler, with whom he's ideally going to try and trade the most. importantly, it extends the gap to Dries Van Four, who's yeah. 19th. That's probably what Christopher House's objective is. And this is Van Thor. We'll ride with him for a lap here, coming out of Clark Curve. So, into the dip, the compression, then up the hill. Where is the apex? Where is the apex? You can barely see it. There it is, just there. You have to wait, wait, wait so long before you make your commitment. But by making that commitment, it's quite an abrupt turn. You can see Van Thor had to make a small adjustment on the exit of Pentacle Bend, then slow it down, just trundle around Druids, keep it neat and tidy. Straighten it up, get the power on, be gentle on the throttle. You don't want to slam the throttle, loop, you break traction, lose time. Good exit, clean exit, didn't run the curb on the outside of Graham Hill Bend. Now, staying middle-ish to the inside of the circuit, coming up into Surtees, sort of trying to find, looking, looking for parts of the circuit that are going to give him more grip. Didn't go out to the outside of the exit of the corner because he's got more bite, more traction on this part of the track. Now, flat out down the hill, 240 plus kilometers an hour, down a gear, stays wide, doesn't kiss the apex, 
better traction, better grip on the outside of the corner. Good exit yet again. Chatrice spun four, 4.7 seconds down in the first sector in this group. So what will happen now coming up to the end of his second sector? Watch going into Sheen Curve. I mean, this is controlled aggression from Dries Van Voort. The young Belgian driver has learned quickly how to drive a racing car quickly when you're in adverse circumstances. So Van Voort up then in the middle sector. Sideways, coming out of Clark Curve. Hands on to it, but that will have lost him a bit of ground. It was a good save, that. That could have been nasty. He'll get one more lap out of this as Van Voort goes over the line. The time is a 137-113, but he's down to 21st, I'm afraid. Yeah, and Phil Keane is up into 19th. Yeah. So Van Thor has dropped out of the top 20 into 21st, so he'll be unhappy with that time. And in all of this, just to recap, because we've been talking about those that didn't do a time, at the front of the grid is Fabian Schiller, Nick Foster, then Mario Engel, Martin Kirchhoff, and Thomas Neubauer and Raffaele Marchiello. That's your top six with some very unusual names for the front of the grid there. Who's going to run the book? Who's going to run the betting for who's going to win the second race? It is unpredictable. Checkered flag. You'd say Marciello is very well placed on the third row against the opposition, but Lucas Stoltz and Mauro Engel, a pole and a third. That's a very, very good combination. That black Falcon number four Mercedes, I've always, I think it's a beautiful colour. Yeah. And it's a very, I would say, understated driver lineup in terms of, you know, I'm a racing driver. Oh, oh, oh two guys who go about their job professionally. Yeah. That's all you're asked yeah. to do. Well, as John says, the chequered flag is out. Session's at an end. And we've only had a handful of cars really going out in this second element of it with the rain, but some have been getting useful data. Others have been pitching for a time just to try and help them on the grid a little. But Fabian Schiller, a maiden blanc pan pole, Nick Foster, Mario Engel, Martin Kirchhoff, and Thomas Neubauer, Raphael Marchiello, Clement Schmidt, Matthew Drudy, Tom Gamble, Hugo de Sadelier as a top ten. It's almost like a reverse grid, isn't it? Because many of the star names are further back. I mean, whoever said reverse grids are the way forward, I mean, it has got its benefits, and we're seeing an effect part of that here. But I want the natural excitement that you get from changeable conditions. That's 519, which is Phil Keane, Lamborghini factory driver, and making his way now look down towards the right hand of Clark Curve. But I think he might be bailing from this lap. The job is done, so yes, Phil Keane. Heads for the uh, pit lane and into part well, so conditions. What a session! I want more of them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't want to. Uh, God, there was 30 more years ago, 25 years ago, back in the good old days of Eurosport, Formula One broadcast. I did make the comment to someone who was somewhat important in Formula One at the time. Install sprinkler systems on racetracks. Turn them on, get the track wet, yeah. turn them off, and let everybody go just to get rid of this predictability. And what we've got here, you couldn't have wished, other than, sadly, for many teams, a lot of work tonight. Well, let's just remind ourselves that Fabian Schiller then will start on pole for race two, ahead of Nick Foster, and then Mario Engel. Marvin Kirchhoff will go from fourth on the grid, ahead of Thomas Neubauer, Raphael Marchiello, with Clement Schmidt seventh, Matthew Drudy eighth, uh, new to GT racing, ninth, Tom Gamble. Hugo de Sadler also making the switch from sports prototypes to GT cars, he's 10th. Then it's Marco Papelli, Fred Verbiche, Jim Pla, all star drivers. They've got work to do ahead of David Perel and Andrea Bertolini. 16th on the grid is where you find Florian Schotzer. And then those that either only just got a time in before the weather changed, Frank Stippler, or did it in the wet, Christopher Hasser, Rick Brokers, then Phil Keane, Marcus Winkelhock, Dries Van Thor. Christopher Meese didn't get a time in, nor did Stefan Ortelli. Engelhardt didn't get out because the car was damaged by Bortolotti. Taylor Proto didn't get out because of Diego Manchaka's accident. So Fabian Schiller, it is then, who has a pole position to his name for the first time. Fabian, well done. That was a mega lap, a really good gamble from you guys. Yeah, it was a pretty good lap. I mean, good to be in pole position here. Uh, tricky conditions out there, so yeah, happy to be in front. I think it's pretty good to start on pole on such a track. And um, yeah, looking forward to tomorrow. I spoke to Timo a little bit earlier when you were in the car, and he seemed really excited. So uh, I think he's going to come congratulate you in a minute. Yeah, hopefully. I hope he's happy. Congratulations. Let's see how the race goes tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just have a look back at the highlights then of uh, qualifying with lots and lots of drama. Some of it caused by drivers, some of it caused by the weather. But uh, ultimately, two very jumbled grids. So this was the first whack. Diego Menchaca into the barriers at Paddock. 
and the car turning turtle, so we had to stop, retrieve that, get underway again. This Antonio Liuzzi shaking his head. He's the driver coach to Taylor Proto, who's the other driver in that car. Uh, so at the end of Q1, then, it was uh, the high drama of Mirko Bortolotti losing it right at the very end that was the talking point. Q2 got underway with everybody needing to pound out early and try and make sure they got a banker lap in. That was the Bortolotti damage, so Christian Engelhardt unable to take part in Q2. Lots of disappointment and anger at Grata Racing Team. Uh, Q2 stopped early because off went Christopher Meese, and he was, as he was getting back onto the road, bang, along came Stefan Ortelli, made contact with him, uh, and then we also had very heavy rain that made a wet track for the resumption. So we've got, as I say, two intriguing grids going into tomorrow's races, uh, and we look forward to what's going to turn out to be, I'm sure, some great action here at Brands Hatch. Race one is at 10 past 12, race two is at just after half past four, and we will look forward to your company tomorrow. For now, though, from Brands Hatch, with the sun shining once more on this drama-filled day from John Watson and David Addison, it's goodbye.